So, hello everyone. Um, so today I'm here to talk about mostly my PhD work on interactive narrative. And to talk about a framework, the name is Thespian, that I have been working on with Stacy for several years. So um, this is an outline of this talk. I'll first uh, state the problem, give a little motivation for why we choose the problem to work on, and why it is, uh, and, yeah, why it is hard to attack. That would be the statement of the problem section. And then I'll give a high level overview of the approach that we take to address this problem, followed by a little bit details about the Thespian framework, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is mostly my thesis work on building interactive narrative, authoring, testing, evaluation. And then finally, I'll wrap up with a, a brief introduction of the evaluations that I have done, um, wrap up with conclusion and future work. So what is um, interactive narrative? Uh, interactive narrative is basically it's a, uh, in, uh, it's a new form of media that gives the user in the story, gives the user a control of a character and that let the user interact with all other characters. So for example, in a scenario like this, this is just the um, old Grimm's fairy tale, the Little Red Riding Hood story. I, I hope everyone still remember it. Um, so if you, so the original storyline was fairly simple, but if you suddenly let the user have control over a character, so for example, I put a wolf in the center, uh, if you let the user control the wolf character in the story, and then let the user decide what the wolf should do, what the wolf should say uh, in, in, the, in the story, interact with other, other characters, um, suddenly, I mean, even if everyone else um, still have the same personality, still have the same task and you know, beliefs, Red still want to go to Granny's house, Hunter still want to kill the wolf, but since the, since the user controls the character and he can choose different actions along the time, the story will change. Uh, you will not have one story as what is originally laid out by Grimm's er anymore. What you suddenly will have is more like a class of stories, like a branching spending tree of stories. So. Um, uh, so uh, I'm just trying to, by putting uh, this diagram here, I'm just trying to illustrate like there are many, many possibilities now uh, for the interactive story. Even though you may see some of them are very similar to the original ones, some of them may deviate a lot, uh, there's huge, a huge volume of paths that can potentially go through this story. And the author, or the designer who want to design this experience need to consider this, um, this many possibilities. And this is what, um, on a higher level, what interactive narrative is and what I'm trying to address in this thesis. So why, um, why I want to work on this problem? Um, first of all, you know, narrative, it's a, a story, a narrative in general, it's a very important part of our life. Um, it's, it's inseparable at every step that we human grow up. Ever since a kid, you listen to stories. After you grow up, you tell stories maybe to your kids. You use that to communicate. You use that to educate other people. And also, of course, you use that to uh, entertain people or get entertained. And then by allowing uh, interactivity in this process, um, we can gain this actual engaging power because um, despite of all these nice features in uh, traditional story, linear stories, um, the user is mostly passive in the sense that they, uh, they can only view the story from the window that is framed by the writer. They cannot, uh, they cannot um, express their own will, right? So by doing interactive narrative, we try to add this additional engaging power by allowing the user to interact with other characters. Also, um, because in this case, you know, um, since individuals, users' experience um, will potentially, uh, well not potentially, will actually be different uh, given different choices they make in the, in the interaction. This gives, uh, that's the last point here, <laughs> this gives the author, the designer, a chance to tailor the experience for different users. So for people who interact in this way, for a bad children who doesn't listen to her mom, um, I want to make sure the story goes in a certain direction. For good children, I want to design a different story. So this, this whole idea of interactivity enables this old, uh, new potential for using story to educate people or maybe inter, uh, entertain people more effectively. Um, so that's the motivation for choosing this task. Of course, designing 
um, interactive story, interactive narrative, it's not easy. Uh, because of all this benefit, and you soon see how um, this adding power, this interactivity, at one hand adding the power to narrative, on the, on the other hand it does uh, introduce all the extra difficulty for designing the experience. So when you write a story, uh, interactive narrative it's very, I mean, at uh, some perspective, it's very similar to traditional narrative in the sense that every user's experience is just a story, after all. So you want to influence the user, you want to uh, entertain the user through nicely designed this story. And story, what does story have? Um, when you write a story, there are typically like two aspects you want to consider and you want to take care of. One is you want to have nice characters, you want to have interesting engaging characters have their own uh, you know, motivation, has their own personality. That kind of like vividly engaging your, uh, your um, audience. On the other hand, you also want to kind of like uh, arranging the overall plot of the story or like how to arrange the, uh, the sequence of events in the story so that you know at proper times you can introduce climax in the story and proper times you can kind of like drop down the user's tension. So that's how kind of like how you manage the, um, the, the experience of the, uh, of the viewer or, or the audience. So that's about pretty much every, whenever you write a story, you want to watch for this too. But then suddenly when you have interactive story, when the user starts to interact, the problems become not directing a story, it's not easy, but now adding interactivity, the problem becomes a lot harder because once the user is allowed to interact with other characters, uh, this can lead other characters to act out of their motivation or maybe it disturbs the, uh, the sequence of events that the author has, has planned to happen. And the more basically you allow the user to free to interact, the, wor uh, the harder it is to control the overall experience. So in other words, um, remember this diagram here, um, the author, instead of writing one story, now he wants to, he or she need to take care of each of these possible paths through this story and make sure that there's a, um, interesting, engaging characters that the user will encounter along each of these possible paths because each of them is a potential experience for the user and make sure that um, the events happens um, in the way that he or she expects. So, um, so this, so this uh, uh, when making this diagram, it's really hard to you know, fit in a lot of nodes on, on right here. So, uh, so in fact, you see, it's, I only put like three nodes on top level and two at the second. But if you, but if you imagine that, uh, at least you want to give the user how many, uh, maybe 10, 20 different choice at any moment of the interaction, then this is actually a huge body amount of content that the author need to consider, either author it or um, uh, designing it. So um, when writing stories, normally, you know, people just write it and then maybe discuss with other people. But when designing interactive stories, because there's a huge volume of content that the author need to take care of, normally we need an automated framework to help the author to design it. And um, um, this is kind of like on a high, high level what this framework need to do. So um, uh, it need to, of course, not, uh, so so the whole motivation about designing interactive experiences but because we believe interactivity can bring this actual benefit from just writing uh, a, a linear story. So we want to be able to not constrain the user's interactivity, at least not too much. So he, the user feel agency in the experience and we want to use a automated approach to help the author to design well motivated rich, interesting characters in the, uh, in the story. And also we want to be able to automatically manage how the events in the story should be laid out or how the story should be developed uh, while the user is interacting. And while doing that, you of course not want to break the, 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 the other two points. You don't want to 
just for creating the events, break your characters, or just for creating the events, uh, constrain how the user can interact. So this is the central challenge that I see for uh, designing interactive narrative experience. Um, there have been uh, many works, um, many people working on this problem. Um, many uh, frameworks has been designed, proposed for targeting this problem. So on a, on a higher level, most of these frameworks can be de divided into two big categories. Um, one of them is character-centric. Uh, so what they do is there are automatic approach for designing the characters in the story. Um, however, often the time, um, how the events are uh, in the story are not managed by the system uh, explicitly. So sometimes the author would just hope for, uh, you know, hope for the best. We design human-like characters as real as possible and then hope for the experience to be good. On the other hand, there are another class of, uh, 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 there are another whole um, a category of approach for interactive narrative that more concentrate on laying out the events of the story. So when the user is interact, um, talking with other characters, the system automatically manages what events should happen, what the character should say in, in this moment, what the character should do. Um, most of such approaches are lacking a um, um, sophisticated model of the characters during the interaction, in the sense that I know what the character need to do. This is this is good for how, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, increasing the user's tension or decrease the user's tension. However, whether such actions are good um, uh, uh, are consistent with my character's previous motivation are not carefully examined during the interaction. So, um, while working on this problem, my motivation was trying to. Um, design a framework that can kind of targeting on both of them concurrently. So here is a um, overview of um, uh, of the Sesame framework for uh, interactive narrative. So what I propose to do for targeting this problem is to use a two-level approach. At the bottom, um, I want to use multi-agent system to control the characters in the story as this gives the author freedom to design each of the character in the story as autonomous agent. And therefore, you can gain the power of you know, uh, what autonomous agents can do. They can, for example, uh, choose their actions based on the conditions of both, on both the conditions of the interaction and their own motivations. So you can kind of like try to build virtual human right here that each of them represent a character and they can interact with the user based on their own um, uh, portrayal in the story. And then overarching for manage the overall experience of the story, um, there's another layer that use a director agent that kind of do a multi-agent coordination uh, task that coordinate, that keeps on, uh, well, this guy, uh, the director agent keeps on um, watching the development of the story, predict the future development, and try to coordinate all other agents' um, um, behaviors to try to reach the plot design goals or the event design goals the author has laid out um, for the, the author has laid out for the story. Um, so that's implemented in, in my thesis work in, um, so the name of the <laughs> framework is called Thespian. Uh, Thespian stands for, I think, actor. And then, of course, um, that's the runtime system. Um, there are also automated procedures to help the author to you know, design the characters. Um, how, how do you configure the characters, right? And how any generative system, so interactive narrative system are basically a generative system because you specify uh, certain initial conditions and the constraints on the agents, and then they generate the, inter uh, the interaction. So for any generative system, you need to have automated testing approach to see whether the stories being generated are as, uh, as expected. If not, you need, to ha uh, you need to find a way to give the author feedbacks and then to enable the author to refine the whole design of the experience. And uh, um, so this is 
one of the key aspects of this design, because uh, as I shown earlier, remember the branching tree kind of narrative uh, experience, there is, without a automated approach, there's no way for a human user to like exclusively testing out each of the possible paths in the story and then revise them. Um, if there's way, then it should be pretty hard and time consuming. Um, so um, I've go over the motivation and have stated the problem. That's the high level approach that I just explained. And now I will go a little bit detail, uh, not a little bit. <laughs> so uh, I'll go detail into the Slashbin framework and start explaining how we model the characters and how we enable um, how we, we enable the framework or the direct agent in particular in the framework to achieve direct real control. So let's first look at character design. So when designing a character, what are uh, most important without considering the plot design constraints of the story? You, so there's several things, right? You want your character to have their distinct personality. And that is their motivations. What do they want to do in this story? What do you want to show in their behaviors? Um, you also, um, you know, um, we are not like uh, living alone on this planet. There, we we are aware of other entities around us, and so should the characters. So the characters should have a theory of mind in the sense that they should have um, beliefs and expectations about what other characters think, which includes the user, uh, includes the user, by the way. So they should be able to anticipate this and consider those possibilities of other characters and users' behavior while they plan their own behavior. And um, they should follow, uh, well, at least be aware of norms. Norms are how social interactions are being enabled, right? I, I ask you a question that if only, uh, following norms, you are responding to me. So that's what, um, how norms basically supports uh, social interaction. And people have emotion, so uh, the characters should be able to understand that aspect as well. So this character, um, so the, this this is basically the bottom layer of the Sesame framework, and this is uh, modeled based on uh, the Sexy multi-agent framework for social simulation, which is developed here uh, by Stacy and David Panadas. Uh, so let's uh, let me just go uh, more details into the agent architect. So this is how internally we represent a status of a character. And we represent how the status of a character can change during the story. So um, we use uh, uh, each, each, each character in the story is represented by an agent. And agent's state represents this character's status at any moment of the, of the interaction. A state is uh, described by a collection of state features. So uh, each of these features, a, a certain, uh, each of them takes a numerical value, but it represents one aspect of the character in this story. So for example, the wolf doesn't have cake at this moment. He is very hungry. And actions that happens during the story change the values of the state features. Um, so for example, when the wolf talked to Red, his rapport, uh, his social distance with Little Red Riding Hood will increase. And of course, this is just to give you an example. It by all means doesn't mean I want to model social distance this way. It's just a quick example. <laughs> and also, uh, not only the character's own action changes status, other character's action can change his status too. So when uh, somebody gave the wolf a cake, he will have cake. So, um, um, so that's the agent's status and how status get updated. We, we, we model the agent's motivation in the story as a collection of goal items. Each of the goal is to maximize or minimize the value of certain state feature. So for example, um, here I just used this kind of pie chart to represent uh, the model of the wolf character in the story. His, um, his most important goal as any animal is to maximize his own safety. And then um, maybe second important goal for him is to minimize his level of hunger. And also, um, since we model this, like uh, we try to model like this fairy tale, so it's like human-like interaction. So, uh, so uh, right here, like there are several goals represent um, 
different social norms that we want this character to follow in the interaction. So a real wolf will not, but in a fairy tale, you want to add that. So like different goals has different relative importance. And this will enable the character to not only pursue multiple goals in the interaction, but also making trade-offs based on the context, which I'll give an uh, uh, example very soon. Characters has beliefs, which are recursive beliefs about selves and others. Uh, what I think, uh, what the wolf, so here it shows what the wolf think about other character, including what the wolf think, uh, the red, uh, <laughs> little red Riding Hood think about himself and others. So when he reasons about future events, he will use this mental model. So um, here, let me give you a simple example. So um, this is the moment when Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf just met each other in the wood, and the girl said hello to the wolf. And the wolf has the following goals, as I just explained. What should he do? He basically uh, think about what can happen in the future for different things he might do um, at this moment. Uh, so for each of different events, um, he can anticipate the consequence of the event based on his beliefs, his uh, theory of mind about self and others. So if I eat her, what's going to happen? If I talk to her, what's going to happen? If I just walk away? So then he kind of, this is a utility-based system. So um, he not only, is, so the characters is able to um, project into the future to anticipate future events. And also he, he is able to evaluate the utility of the future events. So uh, utility, so within the system, um, state is represented as a vector, and go is represented as another vector. So utility is literally calculated as state times goals. So uh, the character make their decision um, pretty rational here, uh, based on picking a action that has highest expected utility in the near future. So um, how does this decision, uh, uh, so this decision of apparently affect, uh, uh, reflect his motivation, and also it's affected, uh, it's, uh, 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 it, it's, it's reflecting the context as well. So for example, if the woodcutter Right now, uh, in the previous slides, the woodcutter was close by. So if the woodcutter is not there, the wolf can uh, uh, will anticipate different consequences for eating little red riding hood. In fact, in this case, he might as well just eat her. Um, uh, uh, well, in a, another different context, if he, uh, if he see the hunter is approaching, he has different models about the woodcutter and the hunter, right? The woodcutter wouldn't hunt for him unless he did something wrong, but the hunter will. So again, he will not uh, follow social norm. He will not greet Little Red Riding Hood back. He will just run away. So like the character's behaviors are regulated by their goals, by their motivation. They have motivation to follow norm, and also uh, by the context, by their um, context means the uh, other character's status and, of course, their beliefs about other characters' motivations. So here, um, we talked about this uh, greeting. Uh, so I used this greeting, greeting back as a simple example to show how you know, social norms enables characters to interact in a kind of human-like manner. And that is what we want in this scenario, since that's what happens in the story. I just gave another um, very high-level kind of descriptions of how uh, social norms are built into the system. It also gives you an example of how, in general, we model actions in the system. So um, norms has many aspects. In, in the current status of, the, of this work, we, ha we have only modeled um, norms that happens in conversations, in one-to-one -one conversations, not like a lec not in a case such as what I'm doing now. This is more like a lecture. So we don't really take turns to interact. So um, these are, um, yeah. So these are the four aspects of things that we model in this, um, uh, in this, in, in this, in this. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> two-party. Uh, no, it's actually a multi multi-party conversation case. Um, so the first one is complete adjacency pair. Uh, greeting, greeting back is an example of that. Inquiry, inform is another example. Or if you just say thank you and other people say you're welcome. And turn-taking is a key aspect in this scenario, too. 
Um, so especially when there are mul uh, multiple people, when there are two persons, of course, always uh, taking alternative turns. When there are multiple people, you need to know uh, when the floor is clear for you to take the turn, um, when it is not. If other people have been addressed in the last turn, you shouldn't, uh, unless you have a good reason, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't jump out and take the uh, and start talking. And conversation flow, it's things like you open the conversation in uh, in certain manner. You greet people to open the conversation. You end the conversation um, in proper manner. And of course, you want to consider social distance in all of these uh, scenarios. So for example, if you ask me a rather personal question, and we don't really have uh, uh, rapport or like we we are not really having a very short social distance. I can just I can just ignore your question. Whereas if you just ask me like, what time it is, I'm more obliged to not ignore you. Uh, so just give you a very example of how we modeled the uh, adjacency pair behavior in virtual characters. How we enable them to act uh, um, to to act uh, by uh, responding to such situation. So. Um, Remember, characters has goals, and goals are just represented by maximizing the value of a state feature. So uh, to motivate a character to respond to uh, questions or respond to greeting, we give them a state feature that says, uh, uh, it's a rather long name I made up. Uh, so character has a goal of maximize the value of their, their norm, uh, a complete adjacency pair norm on this item. And then if they have obligation to respond to others um, and they do something else, this value will be, uh, uh, will be reduced by a, by a certain amount. So, so this kind of motivates the character to make proper response when, when there's obligation to do so. Of course, uh, as you can see in the previous example, the character is not necessarily always following norms. It depends on its, own uh, its other goals, such as uh, being hunger and also the context of the interaction. So if, um, if the hunter's there, wolf will, not, uh, wolf will not greet the red riding hood back. He will just run away because it's more important to, uh, to keep himself alive than, uh, than, than, uh, than, than follow norms and not being considered rude or weird. Um, so that's kind of like a high level abstract uh, description of how we design a character how we design motivation of the characters, how we enable the, uh, enable the author to specify a theory of mind for each of the characters, how uh, we enable, uh, how, we, how we can design actions that, um, how we design effective actions on the characters. So that's, uh, uh, so that's, this, that's kind of like um, uh, the basics for character design. And now I'll move to the next topic of how you can organize such characters or like doing this multi-agent coordinate, coordinate these characters for reaching uh, a plot design goal. Um, that's the directorial control process. So, uh, so that's the diagram. So moving back to it, I'm going to talk about the director agent, which is the second layer of the diagram. So on um, doing this task, the challenge um, in doing so is I want to I want to coordinate all these characters to achieve a plot design goal without um, constrain uh, without constrain the user's interactivity. On the other hand, um, also also does not force the character to do things out of their own um, characteristics. So um, the approach that has been uh, taken in the Cespin framework is to um, is to have this special agent called director agent that is not correspond to any character in the story. Um, this agent to proactively coordinate all other agents' behavior. And this, uh, the direct agent has accurate knowledge about all other agents in the story because it's just a soft software system. And then the direct agent has a model of, of the users, how he is able to predict the user's behavior. Um, so before I, I go all the way into details on how direct tower control is, is, is implemented or achieved in the system, uh, um, I'll just give you an idea of, um, of uh, the power of, not the power, like how we enable the author to do plot design in Thespian framework. So when, you, um, when we talk about designing plots in the story, um, there are several things, there are like two types of things that people normally want to 
be able to have control over. One is the order of events. So for example, we want to say um, um, wolf eat literal Redding Hood should happen after the wolf knows where Granny lives in this story. So, on the, uh, so that's one thing you may want to have control of. And the other thing is the pacing of event. So uh, again, let's just use the same example. Um, the author, uh, so this is what happens in the original story, right? So the author may want to make sure that this event happens at, at a pretty earlier stage of the story. And then, um, then Wolf Eats Granny happens at a, later, at a rather later stage of the story, and things get quicker once something starts to happen. Like uh, after Wolf Eats Granny, soon Wolf will eat Little Red Riding Hood, such things. Uh, so um, in Sesame Framework, we enabled the author to, um, to, to specify um, partial order constraints on events and temporal constraints on events, and, co and of course, combine these two type of constraints. And by events, I mentioned here, um, events means not only just like physical events, such as I eat, uh, I eat, uh, the wolf eat later at Riding Hood, or the wolf get killed. It also includes beliefs, character status, such. Uh, so, so uh, this would be a perfect uh, example for that. So the wolf knows certain piece of information can be an event too. Um, so uh, we shouldn't get into the details, but there are, is a certain grammar for uh, uh, for uh, enable the author to specify the relationship. For example, here is a example of uh, directorial goals. So. Um, so as you can see, you can specify several partial orders uh, for the inter interaction. And then um, you can specify several temporal constraints, uh, like certain events should happen before a certain number of steps or after a certain number of steps. And also, uh, we enable the author to specify like uh, uh, the event of Wolf enter Granny's house should happen Ten steps at after. Eh, sorry, <laughs> uh, it's the other way around. Uh, wolf eat little red Renny who should happen ten steps after uh, Wolf enter Granny's house. So that's just an example to show that um, the author has freedom to specify uh, when they design the plot design of the story. They can combine temporal constraints with uh, uh, with partial order constraints. So, given such a design of the um, Given such a plot design goes, how so the director agent's task at this level is, in, uh, while the story is uh, ongoing, while the user is interacting, how can I dynamically uh, manage the story so that uh, even though the user may want to take different actions, I want to make sure these constraints will all be satisfied in the interaction. Well, um, so what does the director agent do? So it basically, on a higher level, it goes through uh, such a proactive loop, uh, if you would say. So it's a proactive, um, proactive, uh, uh, proactive procedure. So every time, uh, so when director agent is being used, every time when the user, so individual individual agent that controls the uh, individual agent are not. So when the director agent is used, it replaces individual agent's decision-making process and kind of make decisions collaborate, uh, uh, all at once for all other characters in the story. And this is what it does. Every time after the user takes action, um, the director agent will simulate future interactions. So uh, for example, this is the current state of the interaction. Uh, uh, for example, if the user plays the wolf character, he has already talked with Little Red Riding Hood for a little while. The woodcutter is close by. The director agent can say, OK, um, what do I predict to happen in the next few, uh, next few uh, turns of the interaction? Director agent may predict that uh, the conversation will continue, but the, but the uh, wolf will not get uh, information on Granny's location. That's the first step. And then the uh, second step is based on his prediction. And of course, what has already happened in the past that uh, the director agent has already known. Um, it will check for potential violations to the author's plot design goals. So for example, um, if the author has a plot design goal that a certain number, uh, at a certain number, a certain steps of the interaction, it takes time for the wolf to know, uh, to know where Granny's location is. 
and now the time has passed and Wolf still doesn't know that information, that's called a potential violation to the author's plot design. And then um, when case when case like this happens, the director agent will try to reach plot design by adjust the character's beliefs and behaviors without breaking, without making the character looks. Uh, Yeah, that's the that's yeah, that's the body of the next ten slides basically. Um, uh, go there very soon. <laughs> so in case uh, so just one more sentence before I get there, and then in case uh, there's no violation to the plot design goals, the director agent will just let every everybody act as he has predicted over there. So um, so this step um, again. So everything is uh, on higher level. I represent everything in the diagram. So when I know um, there's a potential violation to the plot design goals, uh, I, the director agent will try to, try to fix it. What it, what it does is, uh, the first step, he will try to, uh, he, no, eight, will try to identify a event or, like a, 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 or several events that are desirable at the moment. Uh, what does that mean? So for the, given the example that somebody should, well, that's the example right there. So, um, so in the case that it is moment the wolf should know where Granny lives and wolf doesn't know at the moment, in this case, uh, someone should help the wolf where Granny lives. So this step is reached uh, pretty straightforwardly because we model each character's action as a finite set of actions. So at this moment, I'm just simply looking for actions that can reach the effect that I want. Of course, I can. Um, I cannot just let that, that event happen without testing if it's uh, um, consistent with the character's previous behaviors and its motivations modeled um, in the story. So um, I'll give uh, a little bit details on how this step is done. So, um, so given a particular action, for example, uh, Little Red Riding Hood uh, tells the wolf where Granny lives if this action is a preferred action at this moment, um, if I want to test whether this action is um, suggest a, whether these actions will break the character's motivation, what does it say? Remember that in modeling the character, each of the characters are goal-based characters, and um, they have settings of their goals. They have multiple goals, and goals can have different relative importance. So um, the task of uh, uh, of, of checking whether a particular action is consistent with characters' private behaviors virtually boils down to, is there a, um, a set of goals that represent the character's personality and motivation that it can enable this character to act from the beginning of the story until this point and also act, uh, act out the ne next action that the di director agent desired the character to do. So, um, so that's the task we want to achieve. And how do we do that? There's a procedure um, called fitting that basically um, mathematically enables us to do this uh, to 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 um, to do this task. So, what does this procedure do? So, before uh, before uh, I give more uh, uh, I give more details on fitting. Remember, so characters are represented by their motivations. Uh, that's the goals of the agent. And characters have their state. And then they decide their actions based on which action has highest expected utility. So this is how we model characters making decisions in the interaction. And this is a reversible process in our system. Uh, in the sense that based on their, um, based on their actions, we can also get information on what the character's motivations are. So for, so for example, um, I'll just give a very uh, simple example here. So given this scenario, uh, this is when, again, the two characters first met each other. And Little Red Riding Hood is a character that is controlled by a software agent. How do I, uh, how do I make Little Red Riding Hood choose to, um, to greet the wolf instead of walking away? So of course, each character, this is a simplified example, because each character has multiple motivations and a long list of state features to represent their uh, status. So in this case, uh, assume only these two state features are relevant 
to this action. That means the values of all other state features wouldn't change um, by either walking away or ta uh, talking to the wolf. And then, so assume uh, that's the very start of the interaction. So uh, the default value for each, uh, uh, default like value for each of the state feature was just zero. And then by talking to, uh, by talking to the wolf, the, uh, the value of this state feature liking to talk will increase a little bit, for example, 0.1. Or by walking away, the value of the other state feature uh, liking to walk will increase a little bit by 0.1. So, um, so you want the character, or the author want the character to in, in, the, in that context, the context basically represents the initial status of the character, right? So to enable the character to favor the action of talk versus the action of walking away in that context, basically we're saying the utility associated with this state should be higher than the utility associated with that state. So this will enable the, this will enable the, uh, enable the agent to choose this action. And what that means is, um, so utility is, as I explained, uh, a state is represented as a vector, goals are represented as another vector. So utility of certain state is literally calculated as the uh, as state times the goals. So that's just linear algebra. So you want this inequality to be valid. So um, graphically represent that. So this is just two dimensions, so I can still represent that as a graph. So graphically represent that you want uh, the relative importance of this goal and this goal to fall into this area so that Little Red Riding Hood will choose the action of talking at that context instead of the other. And then uh, to generalize to a more, um, well, to generalize here to more uh, to to the full spectrum of character's motivation configuration, you have multi, multiple goals, of course. So that will be a multi-dimensional space. But, um, so it wouldn't be able to represent on a 2D graph, but uh, following the same principle. You basically identify a space in this multi-dimensional uh, space um, that represents the goal preference that will enable your character to, uh, to choose certain uh, one action over the other given the context. That's the context. And then that's how we enable to char uh, a character to automatically make one decision that is desired by the designer of the system. And then when you have a story pass, which is a sequence, you can look at that as a sequence of decision each virtual character has to make along the way. When you have that, how do you configure the character's motivations? I mean, how do the automatic fitting procedure configure the character's motivations? It's actually quite straightforward. So um, as I said, each story path are just viewed as a sequence of decision that each character in it has to make. So, um, um, so each, each decision generates certain constraints um, on the configurations of the goals. So remember the, remember the, the 2D uh, remember this 2D diagram. So that's a constraint on the uh, so that's a constraint on the relationship of these two goals. So you just kind of like travel along each of the paths and collect all these constraints. And by the end, you just use a, a standard constraint satisfaction program to solve the uh, solver to solve the problem. Um, so basically, say okay, if I can can I find a set of goal weights that satisfy all the constraints that were collected at each steps of, of uh, in this story path. If I can, then this set of uh, goal weights will enable my character to act as you described in this story path. If I cannot, then at least mathematically, I have, no, I have no way to configure my character so that he or she will act as you described there. And then you have to change the you have to change either the character design or the story path description. Um, so going back to the, going back to our problem, what the director agent was facing, um, it would try to fit. Remember the sequence of interaction plus the uh, plus the desired action at the moment. Uh, so if fitting succeed, then situation is easy. This action it's okay for the character to perform at the moment. The director agent will just go ahead and arrange the action to happen. Um, 
Okay. What if uh, fitting fails? Fitting can fail. And uh, when it fails for human user, uh, for human author, as I said, the human author has to go inside of the uh, authoring loop, either change how the story paths are laid out or change the character's design. That means their initial beliefs, initial status, or motivation. But if a field for a director agent, um, there's an automatic procedure to take care of it. Uh, so for example, if the desired action is instead of Little Red Riding Hood tells the wolf uh, where Granny lives, if the desired action at the moment is the red should kill the wolf. And if the system, by default, the system models Little Red Riding Hood as a person who uh, um, who is weaker than the wolf. So she wouldn't choose such action because she thinks such action will uh, generate a um, uh, generate the outcome that is highly in favorite to herself, which is she will be eaten. Um, so, okay, sorry. So, what should the system do? Um, that basically leads to this box. So, there is another like loop of procedures to deal with this situation. Basically, what uh, the director agent trying to do at this situation is, can I kind of like, based on the user's observation, can I reinvent the story in a certain way that the desired action can happen at this moment? And this reinvention of the story also wouldn't look out to the user. Um, so, how, uh, so, so, so doing this, there's a, um, how does he do it? Um, st so still, it goes back to our agent model. Um, in, in our agent model, there's a, a there's a function that we took from the underlying Saxim system that um, can give suggestions to, um, well, to the human author or automatic program that how the current status of the story or how, how the current status of the character can be changed in a certain way that the uh, desired action can happen. So for example, uh, so this is automatic procedure. I wouldn't be able to go into details here in this talk. But for example, the outcome from this procedure could be if Red think that she is more powerful than the wolf, then it's possible for her to kill to make a decision of killing wolf at this moment. So um so after um getting all the suggestions like this, um the director agent will try to see um, whether this, this is an alternative story, basically, or alternative status of the story, the direct agent will try to see whether this alternative is a reasonable alternative based on the user's observation. So the assumption is, you know, the user does not see everything that happens in the story. So if there is an event that can make little, uh, that can change the story in the direction that is desired and happens when the user is not present, then it's a possible event that can, uh, that can make all this, uh, that can make, uh, <laughs> well, then this, uh, then this alternative status of the story is at least reasonable to the user. So for example, um, to that example I'm giving here, so if the little Red Riding Hood's mom gave her a gun before she left the house, and she, so she suddenly put the gun out and towards the wolf. So if, um, so the direct agent search for, again, all the possible actions of the character to see which action will make this alternative sta status uh, valid. And then for that action, um, uh, for that action, the director agent have to check if this action is reasonable for the actor of the action to perform. So um, whether whether mom, uh, so that's again just using the fitting procedure that I introduced a while ago. Whether it's uh, well motivated for her for for for, for little Red Riding Hood's mom to give her a gun. Um, well, you can imagine another suggestion is is if Wolf I don't know if Wolf can suddenly get weak. I don't know how a wolf can get weak. I couldn't make up a good example at the moment. Uh, but uh, you can imagine other weird examples. I don't know. Maybe the hunter gives his only gun to Little Red Riding Hood, and that will be uh, not fitable. Uh, that will be not consistent with the hunter's motivation, and therefore uh, fitting here may fail. But uh, if uh, fitting succeeds here, 
and that's a valid uh, action, then the director agent will consider change the status of the interaction. And then again, uh, go back to this loop right here and try to do uh, testing. Given this new state of the story, whether, um, um, whether um, the desired action is feasible. So this slide is basically because I spent uh, quite a while in uh, uh, on explaining that's three, by the way. Uh, explaining <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the director agent's loop. So this is a summary of what he does. So uh, proactive procedures, so he simulates future interactions and check for potential violations according to plot design goals. And when, uh, when a violation is foreseen, he try to reach plot design by adjusting characters' beliefs and behaviors. And then for doing that, there's another loops of procedure. So um, it's time for evaluation. Uh, when we work on such a system, um, we cannot uh, yeah, not. Uh, by the way, it's 12 I have, uh, I have uh, six minutes left. <laughs> 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 there's a watch. The, uh, yeah, exactly. There's a watch. So uh, <laughs> when evaluating the system, um, there are several questions we want to ask for ourselves. So as you can see, the way the system was implemented, uh, one of the key features is we're trying very hard to, to, to make sure this consistent character motivation thing happen, to make sure a character wouldn't act out of their uh, motivation to behave just to, uh, uh, just to enable pl uh, the event design to happen. So we want to ask ourselves whether that is really important. Uh, how tolerant, or in other words, how tolerant um, the users are to inconsistent uh, uh, to events that suggest inconsistent motivations in the virtual characters. And also, um, so when we do directorial control, um, because uh, we propose that's a pretty long, complex <laughs> procedures for doing that, and whether, um, whether that procedure is effective, or in, which, in what case it's effective, what case it is not, uh, can they really, um, can they really achieve any plot design goals? And finally, um, uh, as a whole, as an authoring framework, whether, it's pr whether it is practical to be used on, um, um, on designing interactive stories. So uh, for, for both of the, of the first two items we have empirically evaluated, uh, I'll just, uh, um, but I wouldn't be able to talk about them. <laughs> I'll just uh, concentrate on the last bullet. So these are kind of like all the stories that um, the Sesbian framework has been used, or, or tried to use to model. Um, this is the literary Reading Hood story. And then um, um, the tactical language training system was like the first uh, system that the framework was designed for. And it serves as a, a test bed for many aspects of the system. Uh, for example, we, de uh, we developed the whole social norm uh, model for the system and test out whether the whole system can be used to model multiple scenes, um, uh, a story involving multiple scenes. Um, so that's pretty much the, the main content of this talk. What I did not cover, even though I tried so hard to talk quick. Uh, in terms of character design, I, I actually I, I give you one simple example of uh, how conversation norms are modeled. Uh, that's how I enable character to complete adjacency pair to grade back of other characters. But uh, other cases are more, more complex, such as turn taking. But I, there, are, there, are, there, are four, uh, there are three other bullets I was not able to cover. And I totally didn't talk about how emotion is modeled in the system. On a high level, we model uh, uh, appraisal uh, theory for emotion, but I was not able to talk about it. And then, um, uh, in terms of directorial control, I give you examples all the way for how I can um, make my character to do a to do a different action that uh, that that's against what has been predicted at the first time. But I didn't talk about how I can make the user change his decisions. Um, and in terms of the authoring framework itself, I I didn't talk too much about most of the procedures. For example, uh, the procedure that I emphasized at the very beginning. How do, I how do I model the user and how do I simulate the user as an approach for testing the system? Um, so those are not covered by this talk, but I have like uh, papers on my homepage that covers all these aspects. 
uh, in conclusion, so I think in this work, like years of working on interactive narrative, I think my con con contribution are as following. Uh, I think the key is, I think, identifying the challenges for designing interactive narrative. Let me just reiterate it. So uh, you want to support open-ended user interaction. You don't want to constrain the user. You want to support creation of well-motivated, rich character. You want to be able to direct the interaction, which is directorial control, without breaking the characters. And finally, you want to uh, build automated approach to enable all of the above. And then um, to attack that challenge, I proposed and implemented a multi-agent system for, uh, for realizing interactive narrative. The name of it is Thespian. And I demonstrated the generality and effectiveness of the system. Well, that uh, there's not. So I skipped a lot of evaluations, but um, have done work to demonstrate uh, the effect effectiveness of the system components. Um, there are many future directions for this work. Um, so um, several, several things that I listed here that I'm particularly interested to work on in the near future. One is how to facilitate plot design. Um, so as one of my evaluation was on the effectiveness of directorial control. And through that evaluation, I find out designing those partial order constraints and uh, temporal constraints may not be a trivial task. So I want to, in the future, so right now it's totally in the author's hand to design these constraints. And in the future, I want to be able to enable, uh, I want to be able to build some automated procedures to help the development process. And of course, um, enriching the model of each of the individual characters so that they behave more human-like is always one of my goals. Um, and also, um, interactive narrative, I consider it as a type of virtual environment. Uh, for any virtual environment, the experience of presence or like being immersed in the environment is a key. So I want to be able to model this experience of presence in the interaction. And finally, the system is modeled at the level of speech act. I don't know if you have noticed. Uh, so it's systems is great of thank you, inquiry about certain things, but not the actual dialogue and not the actual behavior. So it's, of course, a huge step, but a very interesting uh, field to, um, to be able to model from decision making, from motivation to, I'm done, to the speech act and uh, nonverbal behaviors. Uh, yeah, I'll just stop here and take questions. So, any questions for me? Yeah, I can. Uh, if you do. So, I, I'm just uh, it seems like an amazing uh, context and, and, and system that you got. Are there any examples of this running in action? Is there anything where the real characters? talk to each other, play out a scene, you can watch the results in any way? Yeah, so there are like several examples. I think the only thing that is currently up and running is the literary Reading Group story. Um, it's not that fancy because it's a, I only, like the system works on the speech acts level, so at that level, you kind of like manually input the result, manually input the, 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 the sentence and then the system respond to you in the text string, that is the response from the characters. And then I build a 2D graphic environment to just like, show the pictures, but it's not that fancy. Is there a, a video online? Video, I have, uh, have a Java applet that kind of like uh, animates the interaction history. Um, it used to be just on my homepage, also, but it's taking it's off. The actual language it's running in, which we can easily. Yeah, it has been several years. Yeah. I have some we very have old, some old video. That, but we actually, the application, the version that it that's true. I just think this thing is a little bit old since that's from 2005. The one that's current is that one right there in, uh, in the middle. That uh, in about a month or two will probably have something to play with. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to pick the best one. So. In your system, uh, what happens to the agents when the player agent is not around, like is not on screen, so to speak? So do, do the other agents uh, interact with each other? They do. Uh, yeah. 
So the system is model kind of, uh, it doesn't model, uh, uh, it kind of models all the c characters in the equivalent way, in the sense that each of them is represented by agent, and each of the agents is filled in almost the same amount of details. Of course, for modeling the user, uh, there are some actual components added to represent like human user's explorative behavior. <coughs> but other than that, um, they're all pretty similar. So they do interact. They, so the other characters doesn't really know which one is the user, which one is uh, yeah. one of them. Yes. But like, as, as the user goes, um, goes along through the story, the other characters talk amongst, uh, amongst themselves. They do. But we're, we're just not shown that. But um, do it. Well, In this other words, there is yeah. an environment. Like, how do you model the, the environment of the story, the map of the, the map of little bit writing? Oh, so every char uh, so it's a turn-based system. Okay. So at every step, each of the agents, including the agent that, that was controlled by the user, do one action. <laughs> okay. So so the user do one thing, and everyone else do their thing. Yeah. And then uh, there are moments when the user just do nothing, and then everyone else will still interact. Well, if they are together, if there's a reason for them to interact, will still interact. There are certain risks with editing the character's beliefs on the fly, I think, and you highlighted one, and that is the believability yeah. of the change you're making. Uh, what about um, other possible side effects, such as suppose there's a bear character in Little Red Riding Hood, and you dialed up the wolf's interest in talking, and then he decides to talk to the bear and gets eaten, whereas uh, he would have run away otherwise. Can things like that happen? Uh, things like that? Well, you change something and then yeah, so that's, that's kind of like a more general question for directorial control. So, so right now, uh, let me cast it in a different way and see if it's consistent with what you said. So right now, the direct agent only looking forward with certain steps, and that's all because of... Perf so the real issue is performance issue, how fast you can do this, and it is really slow. <laughs> uh, uh, for reality. So the direct agent only look at the near future. For, for me, it's only like two, three steps into the future. Uh, no, maybe no, not more than 10 for sure it's for all the evaluations. So, so you do these things to reach like this local optimization. But then that certainly can break, uh, can break the long-term optimization. So you did, you, you did this thing to enable the character to follow in the following the directorial goals and then the break it later on. It happens and I think the only solution I'd, I think was to just let the director agent look forward all the way, like 20 steps toward the end, but then that's too slow. So that's truly a, a problem. Well, if you want to change it back later, you have to consider if the, if the well, that's directorial control action of changing it back will make the character again sounds inconsistent. If, I mean, some, for some actions, it doesn't matter. I like to talk this time. I don't want to talk the other time. But maybe for something else, it will suggest a break of uh, their motivation again. Um, yeah. so I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the rationale behind the whole architecture. So having, um, I, I can see having the, the individual agents be, I can sort of see why you want them to be, uh, to, to have their, be internally consistent and each of them independent. But then you have this director. The director has these overarching goals. And why wouldn't, if, if that's what we want, why mm -hmm. don't, wouldn't the director manipulate the character's action directly? Why, it, it just seems like, a, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what does it mean for the director to change the characters so that they act like he wants them to. Why, why would the director manipulate them directly? It does. As a matter of fact, when the director agent is functioning, all other agents just become part of the director agent's belief. Um, so the director agent make decisions for all other characters all at once um, during the interaction. So why do so you need all this internal structure? <laughs> so the key is you can use a director agent. You can use any other things to, to you can use a planner, right? To, to reach plot design goals. That's, that is probably more powerful than the director agent represented here. The key is, in the process, how do you model the character's motivations along the way at each step so that you can watch for um, danger, be, um, not, well, danger in terms of uh, um, threatening the characters, um, threatening the impact, threatening the characters' personalities, 
So making inconsistent or confusing case for the user. So this whole motivation of model each of the, uh, e building this f complex model for each of the characters to make sure the direct agent has a good idea of, at this moment, what is a recent move for this character and what is not. Right, but in the char at each point in time, the characters are consistent or, you know, and believable. But you are, is a character believable over a series of steps? Yeah, if that's I, the moment. Know, that, that's the they point. Would psychotic? Because, you know, I, I, I talk to Little Red Riding Hood now, and then something funny happens, and the director decides to change her personality. And if I only talk to her the second after 10 steps, then she would seem OK. But since I, as a user, remember what she was like before, then now she's a schizophrenic or something. Yeah, that's the whole point of having the director agent, because this guy remember the history of the interaction and keep the model of, of the, for example, the later red riding hood from the very first step until this moment. So I mean, of course, they cannot do a task as well as a human can do. But mathematically or computationally, we try to model this process as, I can see you're still confused. I, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so, so the key, well, the, I guess the question is why, why don't we just throw out the character model and use a planner to plan the events, right? And to answer that question, is using a planner, there's not a good way to track the character's beliefs and motivations at each step of the interaction on all different paths, on all different ways to go through the story. So all the effort on modeling individual character um, in this perspective is to just give the director agent a reference of what he can do, what he cannot do in terms of ordering individual character to perform an action. Yes no.